Welcome to the 38th anniversary of the L. Ron Hubbard Presents Writers and Illustrators of the Future. And for our thousands of internet viewers worldwide, we have gathered this evening at the Taglin Complex in Hollywood, California. The men of reason nurtured light to save a battered earth. The men of anger scrambled high to kill all things of worth. The men of anger raged and fought and out of anger died. That spot of light upon yon cliff has often gutted low, but men of reason try again. A thousand eons so. The men of reason nurtured life to save a battered earth, to save a battered earth. The men of reason try again a thousand years. And so a thousand and so the men of anger scrambled high to kill all. Of worth, they scrambled high. The men of anger rage and fought, and out of anger, I said, I out of anger die. Often guttered low, and something guttered low. But men of reason try again a thousand eons so. Before there can be accomplishment, there must first be vision. The power to see things not merely as they are now, but as they might become. In daring to imagine, 
we see beyond the mundane to that which delights and inspires, engages and uplifts. With such dreams, we advance social, political and philosophical thought and drive innovation in art, science, literature and technology. A culture is only as great as its dreams and its dreams are dreamed by artists. But mere dreams are not enough. To be useful, vision must be shared widely so that all may contribute their talents to its realization, be they teachers or builders, organizers or fabricators. Not merely words, but images and models and music that speak to both the mind and the heart and uniquely reach each person. These are the true visionaries. These are the architects of the future. The artist injects the spirit of life into a culture, and through his creative endeavors, the writer works continually to give tomorrow a new form. L. Ron Hubbard understood the power of visionaries to build a tomorrow full of promise and hope power and accomplishment. Starting early in his career as a renowned storyteller of popular fiction, he worked to not only inspire the next generation of storytellers, but to equip them with the tools of art and craft necessary to succeed. From its earliest beginnings, the inaugural Golden Pen Award provided the means to assist the next generation of creative voices to reach the greatest possible audience. Join us in celebrating both the giants of our past and present and the next generation of visionaries of tomorrow. L. Ron Hubbard presents the writers and illustrators of the future. Please welcome our mistress of ceremonies, executive director of author services, representing the literary works of L. Ron Hubbard, Ms. Gunhild Jacobs. Thank you very much, and good evening. I know, it feels like we were just here, and we actually were. <laughs> but after global setbacks, we are now back on schedule to present this year's winners, plus a few previous awardees. So with that, let me welcome all of you from all of us at Author Services and Galaxy Press to the 2022 celebration of science fiction writing and art. We have 30 winners with us tonight, 23 from volume 38, and seven from volumes 36 and 37 who were not able to attend last year. In addition to the awards, we are honored to hear from retired three-star Lieutenant General John F. Thompson of the United States Air Force as our keynote speaker. You will also see two video presentations. First, a plea to humanity in a stunning visual recital of the L. Ron Hubbard poem, Declaration of Peace. The second one is from the legendary artist and illustrators of the future judge, Frank Frasetta. As for the backbone of the contest, the judges, I want to especially welcome all of you who have once again braved it out to Hollywood to celebrate present and past winners. This includes our new Writers of the Future coordinating judge, Jody Lynn Nye, and the new editor for the annual anthology, Dean Wesley Smith. Will all of our incredible judges who are here with us tonight please stand to be acknowledged. welcome many new wonderful judges from this stage. I have, thankfully, said goodbye to less. 
but this goodbye has got to be the toughest of all. Dave Wolverton, also known to many as David Farland, 1987 Writers of the Future Grand Prize winner of Volume 3, best-selling author, Writers of the Future judge, Writers of the Future contest coordinating judge, Writers of the Future anthology editor, mentor, teacher, friend. Dave was like my twin brother in writing. We were new writers together. We published our first novels within a year of each other. Dave loved to learn and he loved to teach. He and I together taught workshops and we even concocted the Superstars Writing Seminar so we could pass along a bunch of our professional information along with our co-founders, Brandon Sanderson and Eric Flint and my wife, Rebecca Mesta. He left a huge impact on the world, and all writers will miss him, and I miss him terribly myself. Dave Farland was a good friend and a very talented teacher, and I know that his students looked up at him as a mentor and someone who would have their backs, teaching them with the greatest of goodwill and real gentleness, so that even the most nervous student got the best of his ability and his advice. I think that Dave was one of the kindest people that I ever knew, and I'm privileged to have known him. I first met Dave Wolverton in, it must have been 1986, when he was one of the winners of the Writers of the Future, with his story, On My Way to Paradise. And even as early as that, in the workshop situation, it was clear that he had an uncanny ability to see the strength in stories considered. And since then, co-teaching the workshop with him, I was constantly startled by the way he could see through the manuscript to the story that had been in the writer's mind. And so really working in the workshop with him was always a privilege, as much for me as it was for the winners. When he would explain story structure, I would find myself taking notes right along with the winners. And I like to think I benefited as much from his insights as they did. Over 35 years, Dave and I grew up in this industry together. We were friends, we were colleagues, and we had tremendous amounts of discussions about writing, about how to teach writing, um, since we're both teachers. And I just love those conversations. I love sitting next to Dave on a panel and he and I'd be going back and forth about something. It was always fun, it was always friendship. The last time I saw Dave, he had come to Las Vegas, which is where I live, to help us teach a workshop, which is so Dave. We needed his expertise on a bunch of topics, and he came and willingly taught them. We were very grateful. I will miss Dave. I think we will all miss Dave. He was a very good man. David Farland was already a best-selling author, and he signed up for my literary boot camp one summer. Not once during the workshop did he ever pull rank and regale us with anecdotes about the famous people he'd known and the movies that he had worked on. His critiques of other people's work were modestly presented, encouraging, helpful, always really, really smart, and yet never ostentatious in any way. Through all the years that I've known Dave, it's been inspirational to watch how he's influenced so many people's lives and the effect that he's had on so many aspiring authors and artists and everybody around him. And I look forward to looking for pieces of him in the works and creations of his students and those he's influenced. Humble and kind, David was always there for us. And for those of us who believe in magic and higher powers, I think Dave's last words in his last story written for volume 38 
entitled, A Word of Power, Say It All, and I quote, The wise woman, Fava, realized it was a word of power greater than others, more potent than any weapon she could imagine. Come to the stars, my friends. Lay down your weapons and come. To the stars, Dave, and may your message of peace come to pass. Now, we traditionally present an overview of the year, so let me give you a few highlights. As for the contest, we now have had over 6,000 core students progressing through or completed on the online Writers of the Future workshop. The Writers of the Future Forum was awarded the best writers discussion forum by the Critters Readers Poll in 2021. Our Writers and Illustrators of the Future podcast was syndicated and has exploded in popularity with over a million listeners regularly tuning in to the weekly episodes. As for past winners, B. Jackson, Grand Prize Illustrator for Volume 24, had her second New York Times bestseller with her cover art for the middle grade novel We Are Family by LeBron James. Ken Liu, Volume 19 winner, who has since gone on to win multiple Hugo Awards, won the Locus Award in the collection category for The Hidden Girl and Other Stories. Michael Michera, Polish artist and Volume 33 Grand Prize Illustrator winner, immigrated from Poland and is now working for Paramount Pictures as a concept artist. As for our judges, Writers of the Future judges Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson celebrated the release of the Academy Award-winning Dune and continued their popular Dune Universe book releases. Volume 18 winner and now a writer judge Nnedi Okorafor released her new novel, Remote Control, with the National Public Radio calling her world-building breathtakingly vast. Past entrant and Writers of the Future judge Brandon Sanderson stunned the literary world when four secret novels that he wrote during the pandemic became the highest funded Kickstarter of all time at over $40 million. <laughs> so there you have it. And that doesn't even cover the several pages of awards listed in volume 38. And now, to release Elvon Hubbard Presents Writers of the Future, Volume 38, please welcome the President, Galaxy Press, Mr. John Goodwin. Thank you. Through decades of an ever-changing publishing industry and two years of interesting challenges, one thing will never change. The printed words and the printed illustrations in our annual L. Ron Hubbard Writers of the Future Anthology. And with the contest and the anthologies continuing into perpetuity, it is now my honor and privilege to officially release the L. Ron Hubbard Presents Writers of the Future Volume 38, and here it is.
the cover art, The Mammoth Leaders, is created by illustrators of the future contest judge, Bob Eggleton. It is a fusion of prehistoric mammoths with an alien robot race. The art was dedicated by Bob to the late David Farland, who wrote the story, A Word of Power, inspired by the cover. This was the last story David Farland wrote before his untimely passing just a few days after he finished his final editorial details on this year's anthology. As much as we are proud to have published his grand prize winning story, On My Way to Paradise, in volume three, we are sad, but also honored to now publish his last words in volume 38. In addition to a word of power, we included two more bonus stories, The Daddy Box by Frank Herbert, who, by the way, was also a Writers of the Future contest judge, and The Professor Was a Thief by contest founder L. Ron Hubbard. The anthology, of course, contains all the prize-winning stories with illustrations in a stunning full-color art gallery up front. The stories are diverse, ranging from urban fantasy to magical realism, and from military sci-fi to time travel. They provide something for any reader of science fiction and fantasy, while the aspiring writer or artist can read the book to see what the judges are looking for and what it takes to win. You will also be able to read articles and tips from established pros in the form of educational essays on the craft of writing and illustration. The Illustrators of the Future Contest and the Importance of Art Direction by the Illustrator Contest Coordinating Judge Echo Chernick. The Third Artist, a biographical work of advice from Illustrator Contest Judge Diane Dillon. The single most important piece of advice, and important advice it truly is, by Frank Herbert. Teamwork, getting the best out of two writers by writer contest judges Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. And Booze and Taboos by L. Ron Hubbard, wherein he, back in 1936, among other things, lobbied for strong female protagonists. Volume 38 releases this summer in stores throughout the United States, Canada, Australia, the UK, and South Africa, and online in New Zealand and throughout Asia, Europe, Central, and South America. It is available for pre-order now, and those in attendance here will be able to get your copies now. Yeah. <laughs> And as for my parting words, these are writers selected by many of your favorite authors as the best of the best new talent in the field of science fiction and fantasy. These will be your next favorite authors. These are their winning stories. See for yourself why they were selected. And to quote from Elwin Hubbard in the very first volume of Writers of the Future published 38 years ago, I'm very proud to present the winners. Good luck to all other writers of the future, and good reading. Thank you. And now, on to the awards. Each quarter, entrants from around the world submit their stories and illustrations to the contest where the coordinating judges select honorable mentions, silver honorable mentions, semi-finalists, and finalists. Our blue ribbon panel of judges then narrows them down to the winners, three writers and three illustrators. Since it is a quarterly contest, the process repeats every three months. At the end of the year, a second phase of the illustrator contest begins. We commission the 12 artists to illustrate one of the winning stories with a 30-day deadline. This is done under the art direction of contest coordinating judge Echo Turnick. These are the illustrations that are judged for the grand prize and also published alongside the winning stories in the annual anthology. While all the winners get prestigious awards, only one writer and one illustrator will receive the L. Ron Hubbard Golden Pen and Golden Brush Awards, an achievement that often changes the course of their lives. As for the sequence of awards in tonight's ceremony, past volume 36 and 37 winners will be presented first, followed by the volume 38 winning authors and illustrators. 
Finally, we will present two past grand prize winners and the two current Volume 38 grand prize winners. And now, to present our first awardees, please welcome Writers of the Future judge, Tim Powers. J.L. George from Cardiff, Wales, was a first place winner for volume 36 with her story, Catching My Death, where the question remains, will yours be a good death or a bad one? You have to catch it to find out. <laughs> volume 36 winner, Michael Gardner, is from Australia. His story, Foundations, is about a universe where a house is how you keep giving to those you love after you're gone. And it's not an easy thing to escape. Please congratulate them both. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much to the judges and to the organisers who worked so very hard to make all of this happen. Um, I sadly never got to meet David Farland, but I'm so grateful for his generous and encouraging editing, as well as to Caitlin Goldberg, Goldberg who created the beautiful art that accompanies the story. Um, but most of all, I'd like to say thank you to my family, to my mum, Chris, my partner, Gez, and my sister, Becky, for always encouraging me and never asking me to explain what I was writing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Diolchen Fawr. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, we were first told about, or Jess and I, that we were winners back in 2019, so it's been a long two and a half years <laughs> to get here. Um, but the wait's been worth it. Uh, it's fantastic to meet so many other amazing writers. Uh, to talk shop, make new friends, and to meet some of my favourite authors, although sadly we didn't get to meet Dave Farlam. I'm grateful that many years ago L. Ron Hubbard established this award, and I'd like to thank the people at Author Services and Galaxy Press for continuing to make it happen. I want to thank all of the judges and presenters for their advice, their stories, and the time they've invested in all of us. Thanks to Aidan Andrews for bringing my story to life with uh, uh, amazing artwork to Simon, Emily, and John back home who continue to read my work, support me, and bravely tell me when something just doesn't work. <laughs> to my parents who've always encouraged me, my son Connor, and my daughter April, who since winning this award will tell anyone she meets that I'm now a famous author. <laughs> I keep saying I've got a little bit to go. And of course, my wonderful wife Catherine, who's traveled over with me here. She helps me carve out the time to write and never makes me feel guilty about it. She supports me when I doubt, and she loves me. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. Please welcome Writers of the Future judge, Todd McCaffrey, and award-winning authors, The Winner Twins. Ryan Cole from Virginia was a writer winner from volume 37. He wrote the story, A Demon Hunter's Guide to Passover Seder, where <laughs> Noam only hopes to have a normal Seder, but he'll have to battle his brother's new girlfriend and the demons that follow her. The illustrator of this story, Jeff Weiner, our father, currently resides in Las Vegas, Nevada. Dad, we love you and are so proud. Please join us in congratulating them both and welcome them to the stage.
truly an honor to be here tonight. Um, thank you to L. Ron Hubbard for creating this award. Um, thank you to the judges, all the people at Galaxy Press and Author Services um, for putting on such a wonderful week of events. Um, and thank you to my family and friends who have supported me along the way. Thank you. My daughters, Brittany and Brianna. My brother from another mother, Todd McCaffrey. So, so, so COVID hit and all of my business dealings died. And I'm staring at the ceiling and my, my daughter comes in and says, why don't you just focus on your art? That's what you love. I said, okay, I mean, what else are you gonna do? So I did, so I focused on it. And I like really loved hyper-realistic uh, keyframe scenes and emoting and book covers. And one day Todd came in and said, your stuff is great, you need to submit it. I said, You're, there is no way I'm gonna submit this. There is no way I'm gonna submit this. No one's gonna like my work. I don't like my work. No one's gonna like my work. <laughs> Todd comes in and says, dude. And when Todd says, dude, you listen. So, <laughs> Todd says, dude, you have to submit. So I submitted. Some months pass by, I get a phone call from the ever energetic Jody. Joni, right? Well, she is, she, is, she is on fire. You won, you won. She's going nuts on the phone. She's going crazy. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, wow, wow. What did I win? <laughs> I, I, I like, you know, wipe it out because you don't want to, you know, like, you don't want to lose and you're like, you know, insecure about your work. And then, to make a long story short, uh, to being here is completely surreal. Absolutely, completely surreal. I mean, this is a life-changing event for me um, and for my family. And since this, I've done photo, I've had gallery showings all through Vegas, some of them lasting as long as four months. But it changes your confidence and it changes your view of the world and it changes, there's an internal switch, right? And, and that's really, really super important. So this event and all the things that people are doing here with uh, at Author Services and, and the entire organization is pivotal and pivotal, especially these days with all of the noise and it's so difficult to get above the noise out in the world as an illustrator or as an author. So having said that, I wanna thank, of course, my daughters, my wife, Todd McCaffrey, my brother from another mother, and everyone else here for presenting me the award and to my future grandchildren. You can do whatever you want and you are never too old to start and follow your dreams. Please welcome Writers of the Future judge, Dr. Robert J. Sawyer. K.D. Julisher was a published finalist in volume 32 and is returning as a winner in volume 37 with her story, The Redemption of Brother Adelum, where there can be no redemption for a man who has lost control of his warrior bear spirit, only penance, or so Adelum believes. Rebecca E. Treasure is a published finalist for volume 38 with her story, Susu Kazva Suramase, about a woman alone, but for her grandchild and a fox spirit. Emily braves Russia's winter and Napoleon's army to keep her family alive and together. Please congratulate them both. Six years is a long time. <laughs> um, I would like to thank uh, my creator in whose image I tell stories, 
Uh, my husband, Dan, who is my partner in writing and everything else, thank you for this week and every other week. Um, my family, especially my mom, who is with most of my kids, my kids who are obstacles but also encouragements to my writing. Um, my daughter Maddie, who has been here this week and many of you have met. I would like to thank my crit partners and writing friends that I've met along the way. There's too many of you to name, but you are all amazing. I would like to thank L. Ron Hubbard and the staff of Author Services for creating this amazing contest that has done so much for so many writers. Um, and finally, my mentor, my teacher, friend, David Farland, Dave Wolverton. I entered Writers of the Future quarter after quarter and waited to hear what Dave would think of my story. Six times he said my story was one of the very best in the whole contest. He made me a published finalist. He taught me more about writing than anyone else has, and he will continue to do so through his books and lectures that he has left for all of us. He was kind, brilliant, and generous with his time. And I won. I was so excited to share this moment with him. And now I can't. Godspeed, Dave. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank L. Ron Hubbard, Galaxy Press, Author Services, and everyone who works there for making all of this possible. I'd also like to thank Wolf Moon and everyone over at the Writers of the Future Forum for being so very foundational to my writing. I have to thank my writing group, Alicia, Ari, Elise, Galen, Leah, Liz, and Mike, without whom I would simply not be on this stage. I want to thank my sisters, Emerald, Jackie, and Jamie, and my brother, Bear, for all their support my mother-in-law, Barb, and my father-in-law, Tom, for bringing into this world my other half. To my mom and dad, thank you for giving me the words and showing me all the ways that I could use them. To my kids, Addie and Caleb, I love you and I miss you. To my illustrator, Natalia Salvador, who created the most perfect image of my story that I could have imagined. And finally, to my husband, Austin, who, when I told him I was going to start writing, did not blink, did not make a face, just said, cool, what about? And has been unfailing in his support ever since. Thank you. Please welcome Writers of the Future judge, Dr. Nettie Okorafor. Writer winner for volume 38, Azure Author, Arthur, currently resides in Texas. Her story, Agatha's Monster, is about a world where monster killing and trapping is big business, but one girl from a hunter family decides she won't kill monsters. As a matter of fact, her best friend is one. The illustrator of this story is Zane Lodi from Florida. Please welcome them both to the stage. stairs without falling. <laughs> uh, when I was a child, I rarely saw fiction that looked like me. Um, it existed. Thank you, Octavia Butler, uh, for being an inspiration. Um, it's contests like this, presses like this, that open doors for access and representation matters. Um, so thank you to uh, 
so much for this week, uh, for this award. I mean, I can't say thank you enough to enough people, but um, I wanted to highlight a few. Uh, thank you to my family, especially my mother, for reading anything at any time I ask. Uh, to my dad, for listening to my ideas. For my sister, for just listening. Uh, <laughs> to my person, Pierre, uh, thank you for your patience when I'm writing. To my son, Solomon, uh, for sacrificing playtime and while mommy gets in, just one more page, baby, one more page. <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Chris, uh, my writing buddy, for reading every single one of my stories, and to Kyra for being my greatest cheerleader. Uh, thank you, Dave Farland, for understanding my story. Thank you this week to all of the judges, especially uh, Tim Powers and Jody Lynn Nye, uh, Author Services, Galaxy Press, all of the moving parts of this contest. It wouldn't work without you, and of course, Thank you to L. Ron Hubbard. Um, you continue to support from the past. Um, thank you again. Hey, who knew you could make a living off of drawing monsters? Pretty nice gig, huh? <laughs> all right. Thank you all for being here. It was an absolute pleasure to be a part of this Writers and Illustrators Workshop, meeting Tom, Larry, Echo. It was fantastic getting to know you guys and having some great conversations. I hope we have some more in the future. Now, first off, I'd like to thank my family, my mom, my dad, my brother. Thank you so much for your support throughout this whole thing. I mean, you've done so much for me in my whole life, and I'm so happy I have some way to give back to you guys now. And I would also like to thank all my professors at Ringling. Thank you for pushing me through all those long nights of painting and giving me new challenges every semester to get better and better every single time. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here. And I'd like to thank Author Services for hosting this wonderful, wonderful, amazing workshop and bringing so many talented people together. I mean, it was just so amazing getting to meet you guys. That's it. Elvarn Hubbard was, as he himself stated, first and foremost a writer with a lifelong vision and passion for the arts. As a young man, he became a best selling author with his stories grazing the covers of the most popular magazines of the 30s and 40s. Ron published nearly 250 works of fiction in all the popular genres of his day, including mystery, adventure, thriller, western, romance, horror, science fiction, and fantasy. Ultimately, he helped to usher in science fiction's golden age with such groundbreaking stories as Final Blackout, Fear, and to the stars. To help aspiring writers in any way he could, he also penned and published a series of how-to articles. His lifelong desire to pay it forward culminated in the establishment of the Writers of the Future contest in the early 80s, which was soon followed by the Illustrators of the Future contest. And it was in 1980 that Ron celebrated, as he called it, his 50th anniversary with the Muse. He returned to the field of science fiction with a monumental 430,000 word novel, Battlefield Earth. This is the epic tale of Johnny Goodboy Tyler and his struggle to free mankind from oppressive aliens and then restore intergalactic peace. It captivated a worldwide audience and dominated international bestseller lists. He dedicated the work to Robert A. Heinlein, A. E. Van Vogt, John W. Campbell Jr., and all the merry crew who made science fiction and fantasy the respected and popular literary genres they are today. But something else followed Ron's return to the field. He created a first ever soundtrack to a novel, Battlefield Earth, aptly entitled Space Jazz. As part of the album, he penned and included Declaration of Peace, a poem to forward and underscore the inherent message of peace in Battlefield Earth. It is reflective of a deep and personal commitment to world peace and the unification of the human race. And here it is.
Hear me! Out of a hell of shot and shell. Out of this chaos of contention. Let us bring peace to pointless fight. Why do we court the whore called war? Why make of earth a shattered night? There is no ecstasy in killing. Love alone can make man willing. So hear me, warriors. Hear me, mothers. There is no pay in slaughtered brothers. Attention, if your sense is fair, heed that which we now declare. Peace, you races far and wide. Peace, abandon your blood-soaked suicide and now abide in peace. Echo me, as in your hearts you yearn for love, not death. Peace, we have declared it. Snarls and strife must be at end. In peace alone can this earth mend. And now find ecstasy in love. Love for Earth. For all. The gods of peace have now spoken. Obey! And now, please welcome Illustrators of the Future Judge, Tom Wood. C.T. Bright from Salt Lake City wrote the story, The Magic Book of Accidental City Destruction, A Wizard's Guide, where a book wizard wants to help a pair of young orphan brothers repair their relationship but a powerful new magic book with problematic spell work stands in the way. The illustrator for this story is Ari Zariski from a small suburban area in Chicago. Please welcome them to the stage. wild. Uh, let me first say I'm so honored to be here. Uh, this whole week has been amazing. Honored to be so many amazing judges and my fellow uh, writers and illustrators. Uh, being around such talented, amazing people. Uh, it's just mind-bending. Uh, but I have a large list of thank yous that I'll shoot through here. Uh, first, uh, Dave Farland. Um, I absolutely would not be here without uh, Dave and his guidance, his workshops. Uh, if you are a writer trying to get better, do yourself a favor and go find Dave's stuff. Uh, everyone, thank you to everyone involved in the contest and the workshop, uh, from L. Ron Hubbard down to um, 
the, the judges, uh, Jody Lynn and I, Tim Powers, all the other judges who read the stories for the volumes and taught us through this week, everyone at Author uh, Services and Galaxy Press who, uh, it's true, they really are the nicest people you'll ever meet. Um, my artist Ari, uh, who created just an amazing piece, somehow captured the entire story in one image. It's amazing, I will never forget it. Um, Wolf Moon and my Wolf Pack writers group, of which uh, there are three of us in this volume. Uh, thank you for helping me and believing in me. Um, if you are a, a writer who needs a community, do yourself another favor and go to the Writers of the Future forum. Uh, it's your best bet. Um, to my, uh, my parents, uh, my mother-in-law, my grandparents, my siblings for supporting me since step one. Um, to my kids watching at home, uh, I want you to know that you inspire me to be the best me and uh, you can achieve anything with enough determination and persistence. And to my amazing, gorgeous wife uh, for being my best friend, and my biggest fan, and for believing in me uh, more than I believe in myself sometimes. I love you, and thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for coming to this special night. I'd like to take this moment to celebrate and to thank all of those around me. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Illustrators of the Future Contest for recognizing my talent. I feel so proud to be standing among the other amazing winning artists. It feels really good inside. I'd also like to give a thank you to Larry Elmore for encouraging me to be the best artist that I can be. And I'd also like to thank Tom Wood for keeping me focused, allowing me to keep focused and to keep my head down, push myself harder. The reason that I am here today, and the reason that I have pushed myself as hard as I did, was because of my family. I'd like to give a special thank you for my family for always being there for me and always having my back. I love you guys. Thank you. To present the next award, please welcome actress Jade Pettyjohn. Mike Jack Stumbos is a first place winner for his story, The Squid Is My Brother, where the daughter of Neptune Station's greatest hero is about to face her most daunting mission yet, elementary school on Earth. <laughs> the illustrator of this story is Natalia Salvador from Spain. Please congratulate them both. Oh wow, this thing is so much heavier than it was in the rehearsal. <laughs> um, this has been an amazing experience. Uh, every single fiction writing and publishing opportunity I've ever had has been the product of the science fiction and fantasy writing community. Um, so in particular, I, I would really like to thank uh, Kevin J. Anderson and Superstars Writing Seminars, Dave Farland, who's no longer with us, and the Apex Writers Group, and L. Ron Hubbard and everything that he left for Galaxy Press and Author Services. It's because of these people paying it forward that we are all able to be here and write these stories and go on to do more. Uh, the win was announced this last year on May 4th, Star Wars Day. <laughs> which feels very important to me personally, hopefully to some of you too. Um, <laughs> And a couple months after that, I sold the trilogy and I've published that trilogy of novels. And I don't... 
Uh, and I don't know if that opportunity ever would have happened if not for the recognition of, of this. And it's so wonderful to be here and to be part of that community and all the people who have paid it forward. And another uh, particular shout out to Martin L. Shoemaker, uh, who's been really helpful for me, especially these last few months with helping me get up to the stage and have, you know, attempts to feel some amount of confidence in my next steps. <laughs> I really want to carry on this tradition and continue to pay it forward to future writers of the future. Um, and then finally, a thank you to my wife, Morgan, who constantly believes in me even when I don't. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Um, winning Illustrators of the Future has been an amazing experience uh, that will stay forever in my heart. Um, I'm happy I've had the, the opportunity to meet such extraordinary and talented and inspiring people. <laughs> um, I'm grateful to L. Ron Haber, Galaxy Press, and Author Services for making this possible. And thank you uh, to all the judges, too. It's been amazing, really. Um, and I would also like to thank, my, to thank my family, because without them, I wouldn't be here. Especially my mother, who, before passing away, gave me the final push I needed to pursue my dreams. So, muchas gracias. Please welcome Writers of the Future first reader, Carrie English. First place winner Desmond Astaire from Illinois wrote the story Gallows with a unique twist. A bartender with a vendetta against the future must determine whether his customer is a time-traveling tourist. Gallows was illustrated by Nick Jesba from Nebraska. Please welcome them to the stage. Good evening. So four years ago, I asked volume 33 writer Stephen Lawson how to get started as a professional writer. And uh, he pointed me to Writers of the Future. And I, I'll never forget the feeling of watching this ceremony online and discovering Author Service's mission to uh, support emerging writers. Uh, I believe it is a defining aspect of leadership to teach and mentor so that experience can be passed on to each generation. And that is exactly what L. Ron Hubbard has done for now the last 39 years. And I cannot express enough gratitude for getting to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, tonight, I have reached my first professional goal. And uh, thanks to so, so many people. Uh, but I cannot leave tonight without uh, thanking the love of my life, my wife, uh, Lindsay who is uh, so generous with her time and support, allowing me to, uh, which allows me to pursue this field. So thank you. <laughs> and my gratitude to uh, author, the Author Services staff and volunteers, the workshop mentors, Galaxy Press, the L. Ron Hubbard Estate. Uh, they're the ones who make this anthology possible every year. And because of that, you are changing lives. And we are all forever grateful for that. Most importantly, um, I want to speak to that emerging writer that may be watching from afar like I did not that long ago. And I want to share three piece of, pieces of advice that have brought me this far. Uh, first, never stop learning how to be better. Always seek more knowledge to include the free virtual version of this workshop. Second, set objectives. Uh, Denzel Washington said something that changed my view on writing. And that is dreams without goals are just dreams. And they ultimately fuel disappointment. And third, from Jocko Wilnick, when things go wrong, say, good. Okay. Rejected, good. 
out of ideas, good. Good means an opportunity to keep learning, to keep growing, to keep writing, to keep submitting, keep staying the course, becoming a better equipped to cross the finish line where you get to stand up here and say, tonight, I'm a published author. Thank you. Hi. Um, first, I'd like to thank Author Services, um, Galaxy Press, and Ronald Hubbard for putting this together. I mean, it's, it's been an absolute delight this week just to meet all these other fantastic artists and writers. It's been so much fun. Um, I'd like to thank Chris Oatley. He's been such a great mentor to me um, along my entire art journey, and uh, my friend Kevin Keel, who first got me into producing art and going to conventions. And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank my family. Um, they've been really supportive and uh, helped me get up here. Thank you so much. Please welcome Illustrators of the Future Judge, Larry Elmore. I'm really enjoying this, you guys. <laughs> and it's, it's really nice. It's, um, Michael Panter from Sweden wrote the story, Lilt of a Lark where a disgraced lark is forced to take the job nobody wants. His songs may sway minds, but though there's no margin for mistakes in the frozen north. The illustrator of this story is Brett Stump from Southwest Missouri. Please congratulate them both. everybody is sitting, sitting comfortably. Uh, I'd like to say I'm a man of few words, uh, but I genuinely believe I might have set a new record for the longest short story ever published in a Writers of the Future anthology. So if you're still reading the book by this time next year, then I'm the one you should thank or blame, depending on how much you liked it. So firstly, I'd like to thank my mother and father for reminding me every day that I am special. And <laughs> I would like to thank my brothers, George and Owen, for reminding me every day that I am painfully average. <laughs> Balance. <clears throat> uh, I would like to thank my girlfriend, Yona, uh, for always supporting me. And I would like to thank my son, Ivard, for always inspiring me. He might not be able to say that his dad is stronger than somebody else's dad on the playground, but he can say that his dad went to Hollywood, so... So there's that, yeah. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all of the wonderful judges that we've had this week uh, for imparting their wisdoms in what has been a truly unforgettable experience. I also have to thank Galaxy Press and Author Services, not just for creating a truly incredible anthology, uh, but also for treating us like rock stars this entire time. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been off the charts, yeah. yeah. I'd like to thank L. Ron Hubbard for paying it forward with an anthology that really does allow, allow aspiring artists and writers to achieve their dreams, or at least take, take the next step towards achieving their dreams. Uh, and I would absolutely have to thank Brett uh, for the art he did for my book. Um, I've had a few people come up to me this week and say, you know, that drawing actually looks a bit like you. Uh, and I describe my character in the book as handsome, smooth, <laughs> charming, so you, <laughs> you did me a solid, so thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and last, last but really not least, uh, for, I would like to say thank you to the late, great David Farland uh, for his, his belief in me as a writer. Uh, about a week before his, his passing, he, he told me that one of the things he enjoyed doing most was playing Kingmaker. Uh, and it really is an honor to be involved in the last anthology that he edited. 
I truly hope that myself and the other writers from the class of 2022 can become the kings and queens of the industry moving forward. Thank you very much. I thought that darn picture was about me. <laughs> Learn a little bit on stage. Uh, honestly, it's easy to paint a picture when you got the descriptions like you put in there. And uh, I mean, you'll get the book and you'll read it, but he painted the picture in my mind. All I had to do was transcribe it. So, beautiful story. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I honestly thank God that this opportunity exists. And I thank Joni for making sure my butt was chasing it. <laughs> Every quarter until I got it. I mean, those emails, Joni, you, you don't know what it meant to me. And uh, it kept me going, your encouragement. Um, I just want to say truly thank you from my heart. Um, yeah, thank you, Joni. Uh, Joni's a special person, and we're all thankful for her. So, give her a round of applause, yeah. Oh, come on now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I want to thank my parents. Um, they've inspired me. My mom brought home a signed copy of Dinotopia. And mama, what do you think is going to happen? You know, that's all I got to say. But I thank you. I know you're watching right now. I appreciate you both for uh, helping me chase my passions when it just looked like I was failing every other class that I had. Um, I was doing something. Just not what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and last but not least, you know, I think everybody's looking for a secret in art. We're all looking for something to take us to the next level. Usually you think it's a technique, maybe a book that you didn't read. But uh, truly from my heart, and I'm a little choked up, but the best thing that ever happened to me was when I met my wife. And when you talk about what's going to get you to the next level, she got me there. And I'm thankful for you and your support. Uh, you're my rock, you're my muse, and sometimes at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're the woman wearing a dress in my painting. I call you out of bed, she's a reference in all hours. I'll say, honey, I need a hand. Hold it just like this. She's like, are you kidding me right now? All right, all right. All right. Take a picture. Hi, I love you. Thank you. But um, yeah, finally, just uh, thank you to all the judges and everybody that made this possible. I mean, there's a ton of people behind the scenes that have been working the tail off to make this happen. And I want to say thank you. I respect you. I'm grateful for you. And uh, also, just the many people that gave their hours this week to do these workshops. I mean, you've been putting up my questions all week. I know you. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, every word is a gift. And I'm truly grateful for those gifts. So thank you. And thank you for everyone for being here. The word impressive wouldn't even begin to describe the portfolio of tonight's keynote speaker. John F. Thompson is a recently retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant General. He's also the former commander of the U.S. Space Force's Space and Missile Systems Center at Los Angeles Air Force Base. As the Department of the Air Force Program's Executive Officer for Space, General Thompson managed the research, design, development, acquisition, and sustainment of satellites and the associated command and control systems. He is also a lifelong science fiction and fantasy nerd who, sh who shockingly enjoys both the Star Trek and Star Wars franchises. <laughs> and he has read classics by Hubbard, Verne, Asimov, Clark, and Heinlein, but does not refrain from reading authors of the present and the future. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. John F. Thompson. Well, th thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It's truly my pleasure to be here this evening in such esteemed company. 
the talent, the work ethic, the amazing accomplishments present in this room, some already recognized but many yet to be discovered, is incredibly humbling. Thank you all for the opportunity to make a few brief remarks and thanks especially to the entire Rockstar team at Author Services and Galaxy Press. This event is a culmination of a week full of important, perhaps even life-changing circumstances. And all of it has been made possible by the remarkable staff at Arthur Services and Galaxy Press. Congrats to all of you for the A-plus week you just delivered to all of the award winners. In addition, if I may, a special thank you to Emily Goodwin. I met Emily almost five years ago in her role as a civic leader here in Los Angeles. Thanks to her, it was my pleasure to participate several times in the Hollywood Christmas Parade. One year, she even let me drive a P-51 fighter aircraft float, which was, <laughs> which was celebrating our nation's historic Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airmen. I did it, and I didn't even hurt anyone. Much more importantly, though, Emily agreed to become an honorary commander at the Air and Space Forces Space and Missile Systems Center down in El Segundo. At the time, that was a 6,000-person, $9 billion per year enterprise buying our nation's critical space capabilities for the Department of the Air Force. The honorary commander program helps educate and inform civic leaders about military unit missions. Improving the connection of U.S. military installations to local communities. Thank you, Emily, for never missing an event and always taking the opportunity to engage with the team at Los Angeles Air Force Base. And to a much lesser extent, introducing us to John, your husband. <laughs> Okay, congratulations to all the writers and illustrators of the future award winners. No matter the field of endeavor, in this case literary, sci-fi, writing, and art, I'm always astonished by the people who are willing to put themselves and their work out there for others to review, perhaps criticize, perhaps judge. You know, there's a wonderful quote by President Teddy Roosevelt that sums up the people who enter the arena. And I won't present all of that quote here today, but in part it states, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. Now that may sound a little bit negative, but that line is about all of you award winners this evening. It's really my honor to be here with you with this crowd of doers. I really admire, and we all should, those people who are continually perfecting their craft learning as many of you did in the workshops this week, doing and redoing and starting over, then with hope exposing your works of art to judgment, and maybe not liking some of the feedback. While it's true that not everyone can win a grand prize this evening, make no mistake, everyone who's willing to make the sacrifices of success, putting in all the time, making the huge effort, well, those people are already winners. And that includes the thousands of people from all over the world who submitted entries for the contest who are not here tonight. Now, not to sound too much like a military recruiting commercial, <laughs> let me also comment briefly on the concept of resiliency. Another element that I'm sure makes a difference in all efforts, let alone writing and illustrating. Everyone has doubts, everyone gets knocked down, everyone fails. 
The true measure of success and perhaps the true nature of your character is how you get back up. As we all know, life over these past two years has not been easy for anyone. Anyone in this room, anyone in this country, in anyone on this planet. Everyone has dealt with challenges, sorrow, defeat. Our response to that darkness was not and into the future cannot ever be quitting. The mere fact that you're here, that you're presenting your work, means you're representing your character well. You are light, and the darkness cannot overcome you. Congratulations to all of you. Now, some of you may be wondering, why the heck is this guy here? What's up with the little old man in a tux, right? What possibly could he have to share with me? Well, it's pretty simple. At this point in this new exciting era of space endeavors, in this new space history that we're creating every day, I really just want you to know how important your voice is. To illustrate the important voice of a science fiction writer, how many of you are aware that Mr. Hubbard was advancing the idea of something called a Department of, the Avia of Aviation and a United States Air Force as early as 1941. Now, if you're not familiar with Air Force history, that's six years before President Truman signed the Air Force into being in 1947. History tells us Senator Pat McCarran of Nevada submitted legislation in June of 1941 to that effect, based on a draft bill and a letter from Mr. Hubbard. Now, Mr. Hubbard's motivation appeared to be assuring the best pilots and the absolute best planes for the United States Navy. And as an Air Force guy, that really bothers me. <laughs> but, but it was a time of war, so I guess we can forgive him. This example is very real world and tangible, but as everyone in this audience should know, many, many famous science fiction authors created technologies and applied yet to be invented technology in their works. Then that tech eventually came to fruition. So let me say a few words about space. Many centuries ago, the ancients knew of space, or at least elements of it, right? They didn't have telescopes or advanced mathematics or even truly effective ways to communicate or share ideas amongst themselves. And they may not have understood details of what we know today as the basics about space. But they were well versed in things like phases of the moon, the solar system's planets, star formations and movements, even celestial navigation. They used space to enable their agriculture their architecture, and their travel, and without any of the magic of modernity. Today, of course, we're so much smarter, or at least we think we are. We are fully aware of the space environment. We've been there. We understand the vacuum, radiation, temperature cycles, and micrometeorite impacts on spacecraft. Heck, we know how the planets were formed. We know the speed of light. We understand the theory of relativity. We know the defined life cycles of stars and galaxies, including our own. Heck, rockets used to be cool, right? They used to be space science. But we now know so much that the rockets, rocket industry has really just turned into transport to space. It's logistics. It's like UPS or the Postal Service. You know, now that I just said that, please don't tell Elon I mentioned that on the stage. <laughs> so, a little bit sarcastically, ladies and gentlemen, we know space so well, right? Heck, there's even a, there's a great book, it's called Astronomy 101, a crash course in the science of space. It's by Carolyn Collins Peterson. It's a great book. 
I bought mine six years ago at the Griffith Park Observatory, right? Yeah, so I'll, yeah, if you're, in case you're wondering, I was there before Adele, right? <laughs> so since we know space so well, why don't we just get on with it, right? Or do we really know it that well? You know, based strictly on what we know, you might be fooled into thinking that that's all there is to know. And there's the rub. We've really barely scratched the surface of space. Truly, we really only know a little bit about it. And most of that impact, most of that involves how it impacts us down here on the planet. In fact, I would submit to you that we have so many more questions to answer compared to all there is to know that mankind's complete knowledge of space today is likely only marginally more than what the ancients knew. And you thought you were so much smarter than the Druids of Stonehenge. <laughs> Truly, we're still learning every day. Black holes, Wormholes, alien life sciences, dark matter, universe expansion, space-time, nuclear propulsion engineering. I could go on and on. Moreover, that's why we have to keep studying it, keep learning, keep accomplishing, dealing with setbacks and rising to the challenge. In this most recent era of space, growing and expanding humankind's space knowledge and capabilities, there are now more than 70 spacefaring nations, and the number of commercial space enterprises have, well, forgive the terminology, exploded. <laughs> We've also learned that many of humankind's planet-based endeavors have followed us out of the atmosphere and are now enabled by space. Things like communications, scientific exploration, weather predicting, commerce, yes, entertainment, and unfortunately, there are some things that followed us out of the atmosphere that maybe we wished hadn't followed us. Things like pollution. Have you ever heard of space debris? And unfortunately, warfare. Today, we understand the value of space-based capabilities to the human endeavor of conflict. Our military operations in the planetary domains of air and land and sea are more efficient and more effective thanks to space-based assets. Precision navigation, worldwide secure communications, intelligence, early warning of missiles, etc. All of those things give the United States and allied military forces a competitive advantage. And I won't detail this evening how we need to continually improve doing it better in order to maintain that advantage. But I will discuss why it drives the need for a space force and what it means to you and your craft. In 1961, Air Force General Curtis LeMay said, looking back at the history of air power, you will recall the first use of the airplane in World War I was for reconnaissance. For a time, air operations were conducted politely and with chivalry. Opposing pilots waved and nodded at each other as they passed. Both sides had equal access to the sky. However, once reconnaissance began changing the course of battles, the rules changed. It didn't take long before commanders realized that it was necessary to deny the opposition this aid from the sky. First, it was air-to-air -air bombs and small arms. Then they graduated to the machine gun. After that came bombers and aerospace had become yet another area of conflict. General May continued, I think we will be very naive if we don't expect and prepare for the same trends in space. And ladies and gentlemen, 60 years later, here we are. Our adversaries around the world, finally, some might say, realizing our enabling advantages have begun to weaponize space. They're fielding directed energy jamming capabilities and a host of well-reported anti-satellite capabilities. Now, my point here is not to give you all the gory details or scare you to death. Uh, there's plenty of unclassified reports available to all for you to look at. And I don't intend to educate you all on the dangers of weaponizing space or how to deter it. 
I simply wish to make two points. Number one, this is why Space Force was created. A service dedicated to space operations, protecting the global commons of space for commercial and civil uses. A cadre of personnel specifically educated and trained for space operations. It may have looked messy, and it was a little bit, but it was also much needed. Number two, we have no idea how this is going to go. Or better said, we may have many competing ideas on how space ops will evolve over the decades to come. We need to flesh them out, do some critical thinking, better consider every angle of space operations. So how do we do this? Well, I know one way for sure. You all help. Your voice is more important than you know. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Hubbard was a voice advocating for the creation of the U.S. Air Force six years before it came into being. Interestingly, in Mr. Hubbard's notes for Battlefield Earth, there's a very impactful thought. Quote, science fiction did not take place after the fact of technology. It was not a symptom of the scientific age. It pushed men into the scientific age. What it said might be invented. Man then invented and made real. Prophecy is not an adequate term for science fiction. Possibility or possibilize would, while not being accurate either, come closer. Science fiction exists before the fact. Un there you have it. The world of the future, the Space Force, the future of space depends in part on you. You imagine it. You define it. You explore its endless possibilities. Those ideas challenge the status quo. Describe future possibilities or contingencies. They compete. They create debate. They contribute to the future and they help build it. To reflect on another component of these remarks, if you don't commit yourself to being in the arena, doing this work, where will you be? Right? As Jeff Weiner said, dude, submit the work. <laughs> if you don't submit the work, are you robbing us? and the future of your vision. Please don't let that happen. Look boldly, think critically, do the work and make a difference. The future is really counting on you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your kind attention. And again, congratulations to all of you. Good evening. Please welcome Writers of the Future judge, Dr. Gregory Benford. Welcome to a comfortably warm evening. <laughs> this is the 38th year I've been a judge. <laughs> and that old admonition, judge not that you be judged, uh, has some teeth. <laughs> but tonight, Envy Haskell from Northern Kentucky <laughs> wrote the story, The Mystical Farrago, very good story, that takes you on an adventure when a lieutenant with a mysterious past discovers an exotic creature held captive by a traveling Farrago they must decide how far they will go to save what matters most. The illustrator of this story is Anna Lee Wu from Maryland. Please welcome them to the stage.
I'm here and I'm still not ready to be here. Um, <laughs> all right, there are so many people to thank because um, I truly believe no one ever succeeds alone. So first, I'd like to thank L. Ron Hubbard for starting this contest, Galaxy Press and Author Services, and especially um, Joni and John for everything they do and making me feel braver than I actually am and more comfortable in this space than I ever thought I would be. Um, and also to the writers of the Future Forum and Wolf Moon for their feedback and encouragement and a safe space for a new and slightly terrified writer. Um, if you are not a member of the forum, please join it. They are wonderful people and you will find a great support group. Also, I'd like to thank the judges, the many judges, who found something in my story that resonated. Um, I actually, when I submitted this story, I didn't think it was going to do anything here, and I already had planned to submit it, but I did not. Um, and a very special thanks to David Farland, um, who actually squeezed me into his 318 art class um, the day after it closed, when I sent him a begging email. Um, and he was just so lovely. And it was that class and his just consistent encouragement and kindness that gave this story its wings. And to Anna for her beautiful artwork and um, really bringing this story to life in a way I didn't even imagine. Uh, thanks to my family, Chris, Kathy, Britt, Alexa, my parents, my stepdad, and to all my healthcare coworkers who over the last two and a half years we have shown what true resiliency and strength really is. Um, and also to my tribe of friends back home, I love you guys and I'm glad you're here with me in spirit. This story, and I might cry here, so just give me a minute. This story was first read by my best friend of 35 years. Um, he was always so kind in her critiques, they were never really critiques, but she was my safe space to go, so I always went to her first. And unfortunately, I was able, or fortunately, I should say, she was, I was able to share this win with her just two weeks before she lost the biggest battle of her life. So I know she's still here with me in spirit. Um, and especially to my husband and first reader and long-suffering soul, you poor man, um, whose love and support has given me strength. Thank you for being the weight on my balloon, for keeping me grounded while lifting me up, keeping me steady in my goals, and supporting me in every possible way. And I would still be lost without you. And just one last thing. For those of you who have stepped away from your passions, maybe busy with your careers, raising families, or battling whatever demons are coming at you, know that you can always begin again. You can always start over. And who knows, you might be standing on a stage in Hollywood two and a half years later, surrounded by amazing people wearing impossibly sparkling shoes and, <laughs> and looking at the next section of your life with fresh ideas. Thank you very much. Um. I would like to thank Galaxy Press for offering this opportunity. Um, I would like to thank my middle school friends who first inspired me on this path, you know, like going together in the cafeteria, um, you know, brainstorming and like talking about ideas and all that. Um, I'd like to thank uh, teachers and mentors online who have um, really helped me out um, realize this. Um, I'd like to thank my family, my mom, for being extremely um, sacrificing of her career and um, her time, and my dad, who has um, counseled me and also um, made sure I was well-read and reading lots of fantasy books. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank my brother for being an extremely cultured person and sharing me his insights, and then my sister for her sense of humor and generosity. So, um, thank you. Please welcome Writers of the Future judges Kevin J. Anderson and Rebecca Mesta.
John Cumming from Columbus, Ohio, wrote the chilling story, The Island on the Lake, about how a son must decide whether to follow in his father's footsteps and accept a responsibility he doesn't understand. The illustrator for The Island on the Lake is Majid Sabarinejad from Iran. Majid was not able to join us tonight. Brittany Rainston is from Idaho. She's a mother of five and is not able to attend as the fifth one just recently arrived. <laughs> she wrote The Last Dying Season about a botanist who must cure a dying planet before an evacuation when she'll be forced to leave her young daughter behind. The illustrator for the story is Jerome Tia from Singapore. Please welcome them to the stage. First, I'd like to thank my family for coming out here, my fiance, Christy, for supporting me in all ways and reading all my stories, good or bad, my best friend, Mike, for rekindling my love for fantasy, both of my parents for encouraging me to be creative in all ways, and both of my sisters for sharing in that creativity in the form of a thousand different books, movies, and TV shows. Thank you to everyone at Author Services for and Galaxy Press for hosting us. This was an amazing, amazing weekend, and to all the judges and everyone who helped us during workshop. I've learned so much this past week, and I'm excited to learn more in the future. And um, finally, thanks to ever, or thanks and congratulations to all the other winners. You guys are all inspiring and amazing, and I can't wait to follow your careers. Thank you. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I just want to thank all of you guys for coming in here today and uh, for this phenomenal event. I have to thank the organizers, Galaxy Press, Author Services. Oh, the amount of uh, talented individuals, both in terms of judges, workshop instructors, fellow winners, has been ooh, out of this world. And it's kind of crazy. I've never been so inspired to draw evermore. And yeah, I just have to keep thanking all of you. Uh, yeah, now I need to thank the people close and dear to me, uh, my family back in Singapore. Hello. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you for being my pillars of support through my entire life and letting me do my thing, sort of just drawing about. And uh, last but not least, I've got to thank my friends, both in Singapore and Baltimore. You guys are the little sparkles in my life that make the world that much brighter for me. So that's all. Bye. Please welcome writers of the future judge, Nina Gariki Hoffman. M. Elizabeth Tickner is first place winner from Southwest, Southeast Michigan. Her story, The Phantom Carnival, tells how when a desperate bid to recover stolen memories goes wrong, Alice must decide how far she's willing to go to protect her best friend. The illustrator for The Phantom Carnival, Xiaoming Chen, was born in China. Please congratulate them and welcome them to the stage.
Okay. <laughs> I'm thrilled and honored to be included in the 38th volume of the Writers of the Future contest. Um, I'd like to thank my husband, Frankie, who supports me in all things and is my first trusted reader. My mother, Margaret, who encourages me to pursue any creative endeavors that catches my interest. And my twin sons, Frank and Nathan, who inspire me to pursue my creative passions, as well as the rest of my family, because they're all wonderful. Uh, huge thanks to the members of my writing group, The One Ring, uh, whose insights and advice on writing are always stellar. Alicia Kay, Ari Officer, Elise Stevens, Leah Ning, Michael Cortez, AKA Galen, Mike Wyan Jr., and Rebecca E. Treasure, who's one of my very best writing friends. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Crystal Crawford from the Writers of the Future Forum, who helped me to make this story just sing. I'm grateful to L. Ron Hubbard for establishing this contest and to Author Services and Galaxy Press for continuing to support and encourage new writers. It's wonderful work you all do here. I'd like to thank Jean Manger for illustrating my story in such a captivating and beautiful way. It was really dynamic art and I really appreciated it. I'd also like to give a hearty round of thanks to the judges who selected my story from among a host of excellent works. I wish I could have thanked David Farland in person, but I'll always be grateful to him for believing in my story. And Jody Lynn Nye's been amazing. Uh, last but not least, I want to encourage everyone who's entered the contest, no matter where, how you placed, no matter what happened, because it takes a special kind of bravery to put your work out in the world like that, and I'm proud of everyone who's taken that step. And if you haven't done it and you want to, do it. It's worth it. <laughs> Even if you don't make it your first or fifth or 20th try. <laughs> I got to 19. Remember to be kind to yourself no matter where you are in your creative journey, because while some of our milestones are similar, each of us has a unique path to tread. Thank you. <sighs> oh. Thank you, Elizabeth. Your story is fantastic. All right, thank you, thank you everybody for coming to this uh, amazing place to celebrate the ceremony tonight. And uh, thank you, Mr. Hubbard, to bring us here uh, as the content creator to celebrate, to meet. It uh, means a uh, lot to me. And uh, during these days in LA and here, I feel the passion from everybody in the story and the artwork. It's uh, really amazing. Mm. I have to say this place is uh, full of creativity and energy. I would love to say thank you to my family, my parents, my friends, and my girlfriend. I don't want to say thank you to everyone who contributes to this and that. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Welcome Hollywood Walk of Fame star recipient Kate Linder, celebrating her 40th anniversary on The Young and the Restless. Wow. All of you guys look great. <laughs> you know, I want to thank Author Services for including me tonight because I am in absolute awe of all of you, to be able to take a blank piece of paper or a computer screen, I guess, now, and create what you do is absolutely amazing. And as Lieutenant General Thompson said, thank you for doing the work and for making the difference. So, Anne Dupre, who largely believes that she was born on the wrong planet, I get that one. <laughs> Wrote the space-faring story, The Greatest Good, where technology suppresses crime 
on the generation ship Eudoxus until, now get this, until a body is discovered threatening the years of peace. And the illustrator of this story, Jim Zakaria, lives in Boston. But guess what? He's here tonight, <laughs> okay? So please, welcome them to the stage. This is more daunting than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank all my cheerleaders at table 17. <laughs> <laughs> then my soulmate who supports me unconditionally. <laughs> Most importantly, I'd like to thank Galaxy Press because without you, none of this would be possible. And lastly, I'd like to thank Jim because, in my unbiased opinion, it was the best illustration there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I had a great week to hear that in Los Angeles, and um, there's a lot of people to thank for that. Thank you for L. Ron, to L. Ron Hubbard. Thank you for Galaxy Press and Arthur Services. They're great people and they give so much. Thank you for, to M. It was a joy and a pleasure to work on your story. It was the greatest thing. Um, I'd like to thank all my family and friends. Thank the judges, I've almost forgotten. Thank you and for all your good advice. Um, thank you to my wife, Maureen, which is here tonight with me, for putting up with me, for supporting me. Uh, I love you. Thank you for all you do. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all the, uh, I'd like to congratulate all the winners um, and applaud everybody who applied. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, also, Thanks for the person who found my speech on the hallway floor <laughs> and got it back from the... Thank you. <laughs> I earlier told you about Battlefield Earth and its companion soundtrack album. Well, this year marks the 40th anniversary of the publication of the novel. It also marks the 40th anniversary of the iconic cover art painted by the legendary artist and illustrators of the future judge, Frank Frasetta. This very art graces the current edition of Battlefield Earth. On the occasion of the anniversary, his family pre recently presented a special recognition at the Frasetta Original Art Museum in Boca Grande in Hollywood. Florida, that is. <laughs> it reads in part, in a fusion of creativity, a legendary author and an out of this world artist created enduring masterpieces that will live on into the future. And we discovered in our archives a very rare interview with Frasetta in which he describes how he created his imagery and characters. Tonight, I am more than pleased to show you this interview and so pay tribute to that which is within every single human being, creativity. And here it is. I couldn't resist thinking of myself as an artist. 
And yet, here was this enigma. I had to tell stories at the same time. Somehow, make it rich and beautiful and subtle somehow, and yet eye-catching, which is, which is really an enigma. But I kind of feel I did it in, in the sense that I, I created images that were so powerful that they caught the eye for, for different reasons, rather than saying being very oversized, large, distorted, brilliant color, this kind of thing, which I consider real gimmicks. And I did it with low-key color, but uh, created uh, shapes that were somehow eye-catching, even at a great distance, no matter what the color was in, that was involved. It didn't have to, didn't require rich, heavy, bright colors. There were shapes that had a natural appeal to the eye, that attracted the eye. As a matter of fact, uh, quite accidentally, uh, my colors were considered muted and muddy and all that by many publishers. And uh, they were quite frightened by that. And the oddity is that it attracted the eye because it was so different. Here are all these red and blue and yellow uh, paperback covers. Understand that somewhere in there you see this brownish, grayish, blackish thing, you know? And people say, what's that? It's the fact that uh, there's really so little color that I might use it very sparingly as a focal point. So by comparison, you know, everything is being relative. You see so much in a sense of muted coloring, soft, tinted areas, and suddenly a, a bright spot. And it's sort of, uh, the illusion is that it's brilliance. Uh, the, uh, most artists, of course, think uh, in opposite terms. They start with a very, very brilliant hue and then try to enlarge upon it and they go crazy, try to you know, decide to drag your eye in different directions. As I, I do it very simply. Start with a basic, dull background and then highlight an area. Ow. It's an old gimmick, I mean, the old masters did with painting. Pick a light source, you know, let it hit here, not everywhere. And it's uh, quite a simple approach. And I look at it and I'll say, my God, it's a little too soft, it's a little too fluffy. Let's just accent it with a little bit of sparkle use strange artistic terminology, sparkle meaning a touch of detail, something a little sharp and edgy here. It's like music, you know? You don't know why one thing, one note works well, backed by another note and so on down the line. Why it's, who knows, it's taste, something almost indescribable. And it's not that very different with art. I don't even say, well, I say turn it upside down. The reason I do that is that you can see that it's got a balance of some kind. You say, he, uh, he hasn't gone off, nothing is leaning left or right. The, the area of the painting is evenly distributed, with very interesting shapes and patterns, and perhaps even color, so that it should work upside down. If it works upside down, it definitely works right side up. It becomes abstract upside down. I mean, you're not affected by recognizable images and stuff. You just see shapes and say, hey, that's great. That's basically what art's all about. You know, shapes, balance, design, color, same with music, so on and so anything in life. If I've observed what I've seen in films or in life and so on and so forth, and there's something back here, you know, that just grabs it and tucks it away. And, uh, you know, just snap your finger, you say you're looking for something or other, and I reach back in and, and it begins to surface. And I, it really is, it's still more complicated than that and it begins to surface then my skills become involved and I start just pushing it around like sculpture and, and until I feel the shapes are interesting. Okay fine so I start with let's say an interesting form, shape, design, whatever you want to call it and then I start thinking of these images as moving around. Perhaps I've seen them somewhere or I think I've seen them somewhere. I don't know. just don't know where it comes from. Maybe it was another life you know. But I have this thing, I can, I can visualize, let's think of something really difficult for any artist, but say a group of lions in combat, fighting with each other, ripping, roaring, snarling, twisting, leaping. What could be more complicated for any artist? And yet I could do that. What experience have I got with lions, for God's sake? What do I know about lions or horses? I rode a horse once in my life. I don't go around studying horses and their movements, but I understand what they do. The painting itself was relatively rich in color. And you create the illusion by contrast. You have nice, rich, 
yellow highlight on the flesh tones and, uh, you know, enhanced by a dark, a very deep, rich background. That's, that's a little bit of a trick, but it works, obviously. How else can you, you know, nothing is really brilliant unless there's something really very dark alongside of it. You put light on light or white on white, what have you got? Nothing. That's the illusion, and that's why that works well. There's a staggered kind of a, a zig, what we like to think of as a zigzag design, which is really psychologically interesting for some reason or other. And I do that to the, you know, if a piece goes out this way, something juts out that way. Interesting shapes is what make it. And then work within those shapes, you know, and create the interest, the detail, and whatever. But I never, I, I never care about, you know, an anatomy study or a, this sort of thing. The design is absolutely first when I work, design. But then I've got to get character, then I've got to create some action. But if the design isn't there, I've got nothing, insofar as I'm concerned. It's an emotional experience of art. Uh, because many people are impressed by technique and style and what they consider skill, I suppose. That's, that's fine, it's all very nice, there's a place for it. But it, it's really last on the list, you know? Uh, originality, creativity. That's, look it up in a dictionary. The definition of artist is a creative person who is totally honest and original. Bingo. If you want to appear to be an artist, and you want to convince me that you're an artist, I don't care how detailed it is, I don't care whether it's less than perfect. If it's original, it comes from the heart, and makes a statement that appeals to people like me emotionally, I just love you to death. That's my recommendation. And now, please welcome Emmy-nominated actress Lee Purcell to present the next award. Hello, it's so nice to be back with living people without masks. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to be here and announce that J.A. Baker is from Sydney, Australia. He wrote the story for the Federation, a thrilling ride where, this is a well-rounded person, a genetically engineered assassin, concubine, and bodyguard has to unravel the entirety of her being to save her son. Author DeVeco, an illustrator, winner, and well-known scientist from Florida, did the wonderful art for this story. Please welcome them to the stage. Hi, I am grateful, amazed, and honestly, a little surprised to be up here. And I, and I hope that that feeling never leaves me. I would like to thank Author Services, L. Ron Hubbard, the man himself. I'd like to thank Galaxy Press. I want to thank Joni for continually saying, submit, submit, submit. I want to thank you, Dean Wesley Smith, for all your advice and all your blogs. I want to thank Dave Farland. His Story Doctor blog helped me immensely, and just, it's inspiring for him to share everything that he knows online for free to increase your abilities. I highly recommend it if you want to be a writer. I want to thank all the judges for taking their time out of their day to teach us all the secrets, all the tips, all the tricks, and how to get better. I feel like I'm better. I hope I've learned just a tenth of what you've taught me. I want to thank the Aussies, Chris and Michael, <clears throat> for making me feel that, like this week is home. 
I want to thank my daughter and my son for telling me I can do this. And especially all, I want to thank my wife, Paula, for giving me the time to go into a little room and to bang away on keys and hope that something comes out. Well, it came out. Thank you. I love you. All right, so I'm on my way home from a soccer game, driving along, minding my own business, and the phone rings. So I break the law and they answer it. <laughs> of course, what do you do? And uh, I'm listening, listening, and I'm absolutely sure it's somebody trying to sell me some warranty for my car insurance. <laughs> and even after the person on the other end tells me, you know, you won, you won, you won. I said, won what? What are you talking about? And yeah, I now know what I won. So it was really an, uh, an aesthetic experience. Um, I'm going to go through a little list of thank you, thank yous. Some of them are very well deserved. I actually all of them are. Um, of course, the author services and Galaxy Press and the folks that organized the entire event. It's fantastic. This is un incomparable, and I'm very humbled by being here. Um, I also want to thank a few people that were involved in helping me along with the illustration process. Because, yeah, like what was mentioned earlier, it's 30 days. Almost sounds like a sentence. Uh, but I had 30 days <laughs> from here to there, get it done on that day. And uh, I'm used to deadlines, but this was an interesting set of deadlines. I've never tried to absolutely have to illustrate something within a short period of time. And to that end, I have to thank a couple of folks, in particular, uh, Echo Charnik, who uh, guided some of the uh, corrections, I should say. Maybe not corrections, it's you're just making things better. Uh, and I do appreciate that very much. Uh, I'm also very indebted to the support of my family, some of which are not here anymore. Uh, my mother and father, of course, uh, they had to put up with a 17-year-old that stated boldly that we would never age, it would always be 17. And uh, I, I'm trying to accomplish that yet. Uh, it's not an easy story. <laughs> I, have to, I have to really thank them for their patience, obviously. Um, I also want to thank my son, Arthur, my granddaughter, Brady, who is a bundle of joy, very, very exuberant, and very interested in my short stories, which is another story. <laughs> and of course, my lovely wife, uh, the one I've cherished for so many years, Lydia. You know, it's rare that uh, artists get a chance to discuss things with their luminaries, the luminaries of the uh, illustration world. And this event has provided that opportunity. Not only these luminaries are present, but they also share their stories, how they came to be where they are now, uh, and, and all of that is extremely, uh, I would say, uplifting. In fact, the word is encouraging. So to make a story short here, a little bit shorter, motivation is really the, the I would say, the, the, the most important thing in getting to a successful career, except for one thing. Motivation has to be coupled with encouragement. And that encouragement is really critical and so in closing, I would say, if you're wondering what really good encouragement is, this is it. Thank you very much. Please welcome Writers of the Future judge, Larry Niven. Ladies and gentlemen and legal entities, welcome. <laughs> uh, Lazarus Black has been working in the world of illustration for decades, even judging the illustrators of the future contest as a judge. Yes, you heard right. Winning first, he, now he got his, his break, winning first place in the writer contest with his story, Psychic Poker 
where Tyson doesn't need to be psychic to know the invitation of the trap, but he can't refuse a poker tournament with the highest stakes imaginable. Illustrator winner Tenzin Rangdahl was born in India and currently lives in, thank you, <laughs> and currently lives in Maryland. Please congratulate them both. Apologize to uh, all of my students who uh, know that I can take up a stage for a very, very long time by shortening this to something I wrote. <sighs> it's an incredible honor to be recognized as a writer of the future. As a child, an only child, both my parents wanted me to be a writer. But everyone I knew, including them, was too busy to read any of my stories. But a picture induced instant reactions. So I went to art school. But I never gave up telling stories. Role-playing games and a career in advertising kept me creating powerful characters and worlds until I was ready to try again. Thank you, my goddess and legendary wife, Echo. <laughs> my glorious children, Kat and Runa. My late parents, Barbara and Glenn. Thank you, Danuta Rain, my beloved writing partner in Australia. And Tenzin for an absolutely incredible illustration. This young man put in over 100 hours of work into that piece. <laughs> and he's in high school. <laughs> mm. um, thank you, David Farland. Um, for encouraging me and saying that my dream was not that far away. Thank you every single one of the judges, past and present, with too many heroes to name. Thank you, Doug Souza, Martin Shoemaker, Nina Kiriki Hoffman, the entire Apex writing group founded by David Farland, and all of my gamer friends over the decades. Thank you, Author Services, and Galaxy Press for this amazing opportunity and event. Joni Labaki, Maliva and Al, Gunil, Mitch, Sarah and Jason, Claude, Carmen, and the entire staff and crew who worked so hard to make this one in a lifetime experience. Thank you, Emily and John Goodwin. Thank you, Frank Frazetta and Larry Elmore. Thank you, Mary Shelley and J.R.R. Tolkien and Robert Heinlein for showing me the way. And thank you, Mr. Hubbard, for your generosity and vision. It's taken me over 40 years to get on this stage, but this isn't a finish line. It's a starting pistol. This experience is so surreal. I mean, <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to Galaxy Press and Author Services for this amazing event and anyone else who has contributed to this once-in-a-lifetime experience. It's been amazing. Um, first of all, thank you 
to my teachers and to my family for coming out. You guys are awesome. Um, thank you to the judges and mentors that have been so generous for their time and it's been an honor to learn from all of you. Um, of course, it's been an honor to be with all of you other illustrators. You guys are so skilled and talented. Um, it's amazing. Um, I'd, I'd like to say, uh, you know, coming from a family where my parents had to leave their home country and not know if they would live to see the next day as refugees, um, the concept of creating art for a living was foreign to them. But despite that, they have always supported me and I am forever grateful and I'm so glad to make them proud. Um, I'd like to thank my brother for always having my back and for pushing me to stick to my true passion in life. I'd like to thank my friends who have personally seen me uh, drawing in class during middle school. <laughs> um, and of course, I'd love to thank my teachers who have given me the space in my little world to hone in my craft. And also, thank you to my friends at SketchZone for being such a motivation to keep pushing forward. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. To introduce the writers and illustrators of the future Golden Pen and Golden Brush Awards for Volume 36, 37, and 38, please welcome contest director, Miss Joni Labaki. Winning one of the quarterly prizes in the Writers and Illustrators of the Future Contest is a tremendous achievement. However, each year, all of our judges review the prize-winning entries and bestow the highest honor, the Golden Brush Award for the Grand Prize Illustrator and the Golden Pen Award for the Grand Prize Writer. Besides their impressive trophy, their publication in the anthologies, and the master level of workshops that they've attended, each of our grand prize winners will be awarded a bonus prize of $5,000. Yeah. And this year is special, as we are going to present four grand prize winners. Yeah. Due to travel restrictions, our volume 36 golden pen winner from Australia and our volume 37 golden brush winner from England have not been able to receive their prize in person. Well, they're here now. <laughs> yeah. And do keep in mind that these two know they won, which is not the case for the volume 38 winners. <laughs> so now, to present volumes 36 and 37, L. Ron Hubbard, grand prize winners, Please welcome the new editor of the annual anthology for Rise of the Future, Judge Dean Wesley Smith. Well, before I introduce these very fine winners, I would like you all to know that I am honored beyond words to take on this position as editor. I was the very first writer all those years ago, 38 years ago, to shake Algis Butters' hand and to thank L. Ron Hubbard for the incredible gift that he has been given to all writers and artists. I never, I never thought in a million years, 38 years ago or even 10 years ago, I would follow in AJ and my friends Kathy and Dave's footsteps by editing this anthology. They have built a fantastic foundation, and I hope to just build on their fabulous work. And now, I get to introduce two amazing grand prize winners. First, Chris Winspear. He hails from Australia and has an enormous amount of great energy about him. <laughs> I've been around him for the last few days, I'll vouch for that. His story, The Trade, is about an alien who visits the International Space Station to provide a potential solution to climate change for a price. Now, give a Hollywood welcome and congratulations to the Volume 36 Golden Pen Award winner, Chris Winspear.
G'day everybody. How you going? Uh, yeah, so I finally got out of that little room I've been running around the last two and a half years. So we can join you here in Hollywood. Uh, I said a lot of thank yous uh, during my recorded speech last time, so I just want to say this week has been amazing. Um, you know, I've been to Worldcon, I've even presented about 3D printing at Worldcon, but there's nothing out there where you get to just have a beer until 1.30 a.m. with Dean Wesley Smith and all your other beautiful judges. Uh, and you aren't just, you know, doing a lecture and going home, you are actually legitimately and selflessly helping us out. So uh, thank you guys. <laughs> and thank you also to my fellow winners. Uh, you guys are very inspirational and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hassle you for your stories. Yeah, you're not going to be able to get rid of me, so get used to it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, yeah, and also a big thank you to, of course, uh, Author Services and uh, everyone at Hubbard's Estate. It takes a lot of work to get this all happening. Uh, so yeah, this wouldn't be here without you. Cheers. Um, yeah, I guess uh, uh, just a quick message for anyone thinking of entering the contest. Stop thinking, just enter the bloody contest. <laughs> just do it. Uh, and also, uh, I guess, Writing in general, like it took me a long time to get here. You have to keep having fun, you know. Uh, acknowledgement like this is few and far between. So just, just make sure you, you know, you're enjoying yourself. When someone picks up a guitar, no one says within the first year, "Oh, where's your album?" <laughs> you know, why aren't you in the top ten yet? What's going on? Uh, and it's like that when you first start writing. You know, you just have to enjoy it. You're doing it for yourself. And as long as you do it for yourself and continue having fun. You can't lose. You just have to keep going. And obviously, submit while at it, but keep going. So yes, thank you all. Thank y'all of Lens American. Thank all y'all, which is the plural. <laughs> God bless America, this stuff. Cheers. I get to introduce now the Illustrators of the Future, Volume 37, Golden Brush Award. The winner is Dan Watson from the UK. Here he spends his days as a mechanical design engineer and the rest of his time drawing monsters, knights, and animals. His amazing winning illustration for the story, How to Steal the Plot Armor, is published in Writers of the Future, Volume 37. Please give another Hollywood welcome and congratulations to Dan Watson. Ooh, I made it. <laughs> they finally let me out of my box. <laughs> oh, it's so great, but so great to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, at uh, Author Services and Galaxy Press, all the wonderful judges here. It's been so nice to meet all of you. Um, thank you so much for putting on this entire event. All of us appreciate it so much. Uh, I'd also like to thank my parents, uh, my friends, and Volume 36 winner Ben Hill, and my mentor Dan Dos Santos, who convinced me to enter this competition in the first place. Uh, I love the sci-fi and fantasy art community, and I love art and painting and reading and stories and writers, and you all really inspire me, so thank you. To present the Illustrators of the Future Volume 38 Golden Brush Award, please welcome the Illustrators of the Future Coordinating Judge, Echo Chernick, and actress Nancy Cartwright. This, this is the best part, I love this. All of our artists, winners have studied and toiled for years in order to develop the prowess that you've seen here tonight. It takes great talent and vision just to earn a spot as a finalist and winner. But the Golden Brush Award was created to honor a single grand prize winner from this amazing group of artists 
to convey our gratitude for their hard work and acknowledge our best wishes for, the fu for their future success. Thank you. The Volume 38 Illustrators of the Future Golden Brush Award, with its beautiful trophy and the grand prize check of $5,000, goes to the illustrator of, drum roll please. <laughs> Agatha's monster, Zane Lodi. I don't have anything prepared because I didn't think I'd make it this far, but heck, all right. Well, there's one special thank you I'd like to give to someone very, very, very near and dear to my heart, my lovely, lovely girlfriend, Haley Burton. She got me through some of the hardest times of my life when I was sleeping three hours a night, two hours a night, sometimes not even sleeping at all. Ah, uh, God, that was awful. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't eat too much either. I'd be getting sick all the time, but she'd always be there to take care of me and make sure that I was okay. And one night, I felt like, oh my God, am I, is it even worth doing this anymore as an illustrator? I mean, I'm killing myself over this, but she helped me through it. She gave me a, a crazy, crazy speech that kind of shattered my world. When she told it to me, I was, I didn't even know what to say because kind of pissed me off, but she, <laughs> she was able to kind of tear me to pieces and say, hey, it's not going to get any better. You just need to get better at managing your time. You need to stop thinking about how bad everything's going to be and just do it. And guess what? From now on, I'm just, I'm just doing it. Like, <laughs> And uh, ever since that day that she told me that, every morning has been a pleasure to get up and start painting and modeling and doing everything that I love to do. And thank you all so much for supporting me and bestowing this award upon me. It's, it means so much to me. To present the Writers of the Future Volume 38 Golden Pen Award, please welcome the Writers of the Future Coordinating Judge, Jody Lynn Nye and Mr. John F. Thompson. Good evening. As the new Coordinating Judge, I am humbled to follow in the giant footsteps of three distinguished writers, Algis Budras, Katie Wentworth, and most recently, my dear friend, David Farland. Each of the presiding, coordinating judges before me have discovered wonderful, even mind-blowing tales that have not only begun careers for their writers, but delighted thousands of readers every year since 1985. My hope is to carry on in the honored tradition founded by my predecessors and continue to fulfill the vision that L. Ron Hubbard had for the contest, to discover and nurture talent of speculative fiction, and so uplift our culture through great writing and art. This year's collection contains absolutely wonderful stories by up and coming writers, and I am excited to present the Volume 38 Golden Pen Award winner. The Volume 38 Writers of the Future winner of the Golden Pen Award and the grand prize check for $5,000 goes to the writer of the story in this envelope. <laughs> Gallows by Desmond Astaire.
Hello again. But first, a Dean Wesley Smith story. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, I, uh, I discovered uh, the Star Trek Strange New Worlds Anthology in the local library, which he was the editor for. And uh, that book was the single most uh, important influence for setting the course of creative writing. Because it never occurred to me until that moment that uh, uh, just someone like me, just a reader, an ordinary Joe who's just in love with sci-fi, could submit science fiction somewhere and be published. Um, it was a writing contest like that and like this that inspired a spark of hope in just a kid. Um, so send in stories is exactly what I did. And uh, he asked me, well, did you win? I said, no, I, I was a kid, I know. He said, well, my, were my rejection letters good? I said, they were so bad. I don't think I got rejection letters, Dean. I, no. <laughs> but all the while learning manuscript formatting, the elements of storytelling, uh, chasing the dream of becoming an author. And uh, short stories like this are just such a beautiful part of uh, specfic culture. And uh, uh, for L. Ron Hubbard's estate to continue nurturing emerging writers is truly, truly a special gift. Uh, so 23 years later, it is an absolutely surreal honor to uh, be able to thank in person, uh, you know, Dean, Tim, Jody, um, David, uh, all the judges, and everyone at the Author Services family, uh, Galaxy Press, responsible for anthologies like Writers of the Future, uh, for facilitating um, the journey of our imaginations to the faraway times, faraway places, um, to the solace and escape of a, of a story. And uh, my intent with this Golden Pen Award is to someday join your ranks and uh, be able to touch lives and influence minds um, the way you influenced mine in this, uh, this wonderful venture of, of written storytelling. So, thank you. This concludes the 2022 Alvin Hubbard Achievement Awards. We look forward to another new year of fantastic entries and flourishing careers for our winners. Keep writing, keep illustrating, keep creating. We are here to help you get a start on your journey to success. Dare to dream, and the future belongs to you. For, as L. Ron Hubbard stated, the most virgin territory there is, is the future. You can do anything you want with it. Please join us now in the beautiful Taglian Complex to further honor the winners as well as our esteemed judges. And do not miss your chance to ask our winners for their autographs as published professionals. From all of us at Author Services and Galaxy Press, congratulations to all the winners, and thank you all for being with us tonight. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.